Okay, so we are um, December 4th. I'm going to finish up talking about trajectory optimization and then get into linearization. And uh, we'll have one more lecture where I'll talk about alternative coordinates and we'll end with um, also doing the course evaluations. <clears throat> all right, so how's this all going to play out in terms of your last two graded things? <clears throat> I have now posted an exam. It's one, it's one problem. Um, and I'm going to make that due Tuesday the 12th, a week from tomorrow. Um, and then, I don't know if you guys have checked this yet, but this, was, this is the um, exam period for the class. I didn't have it on the website uh, a couple of weeks ago because I couldn't find it. Um, but anyways, I finally got that. that that's it's Thursday the 14th is the exam period. And... I put the, instead of having that project report due earlier, I put that due on the same day that the exam period is. We're going to use the first hour of the exam period for you all to give your five-minute lightning talks about your project. Okay? <clears throat> so, that, that's the remainder of the schedule. <clears throat> this, I'm going to show briefly... Um, the exam problem, we can answer any questions about that. Um, basically, the same instructions. You're going to go to the Assignments tab and fetch the second exam. And um, these are the rules. You can't talk with anybody. Same thing that we did before. And, um, and also, don't ask questions on Piazza about the exam. Just email me if you ha have questions, and I'll... Um, share with the whole class anything that I think um, is need to be shared out of our, any discussions we have. And then um, make sure that you have a complete working notebook that I can run, restart, and run all at the end, right? No error messages. It should be organized and clear. Um, there's going to be a second cell here. It won't look, I got the uh, source up here. Um, do not edit that cell um, that you see in yours. So this is the explanation. I'll just show the figure. Um, what it is is a, uh, a trailer. So you have a, uh, a trailer with two wheels rolling on the ground. And it's being pulled um, by some specified velocity, or it's being a uh, specified velocity here that's only moving in this ground plane. There's a a small linear spring here between P and Q that gives some flexibility in the hitch of this uh, trailer. Trailer has a center of mass located um, on this line between Q and um, AO, and P is also on that line um, by these dimensions. And then the axle is, is located B away from that. Um, L is the distance between here and um, that's L over 2, L over 2. Wheel has a diameter. And, um, and then I give you mass and inertia information, too. So the wheels um, can be modeled as thin disk. And then the trailer, I say that it has a mass at AO and then a single inertia scalar that gives some rotational inertia about the um, z-axis that's pointing out of the board. Okay. So this has two rolling constraints. It will be a non-holonomic system, and I'm going to ask you to explain the coordinates and speeds, the kinematic differential equations, and any of the constraints equations. Two, you've got to form FR plus FR star. Right? So you've got to get the equations in motion. Um, you can do it manually or with the Keynes method um, um, function. And then the last thing is I want to know what the contact forces are at, at the wheel. Okay, so if you recall that we can ignore them, they're ignorable uh, non-contributing forces uh, on rolling constraints. Um, and I want you to show me that you can back those out by introducing some auxiliary speeds and, um, and show me what the, whatever the contact point at, at each wheel is. I mean the, um, forces that the wheel feels from the ground at the contact point, right? So those are the 
the pieces, the pieces that I want you to figure out and explain. You can use as many cells as you want. Use a combination of computation and the markdown cells so you can explain your results to me. All right? And, I'll, and the points are there, about 20, 50, and 30. All right? Questions on that explanation? You can, you want to, if you want to take a minute and read, read that too. Yes, yeah, so that um, needs to be needs to come from uh, this. The trailer has two wheels, each of mass mW, that can be treated as thin rolling disc. So you can use that information to determine how you should treat the inertia of the wheel. So the wheels will have um, inertial effects. Other questions? in the description. So if you recall when you're in, um, I always have so many of these open, but when you go to assignments, you'll be able to fetch that exam too. It'll create a folder. You do your work in there. Um, same thing, back it up, right? If uh, server crashes or anything, um, it's up to you to have a backup of whatever work you you had going. Um, and you all have it installed on your computer too. You can um, work there and then upload it later. But make sure to download the notebook file and use that one because it has this grading, grading feature thing in it. So make sure to work in the notebook that I provide you. Any more questions on that? Okay, well, if you have more, send me an email or come by office hours. Um, any questions on, like, the project? I have, uh, you're going to create a Jupyter report for me. And actually, I need to figure out, I'll figure out um, today or tomorrow um, how to turn that in. I may... Um, I wonder if you can, I got to see if uh, we can, if you've already created a notebook you've been working on, whether I can, uh, the grading thing here, would it let me accept that? And if it will, I'll, you can just, I'll make a blank folder that you can upload your notebook to or something. Other than that, I might have you, or I'll have you submit it via Canvas or something. And it's going to be a little tricky. If you notice, the images aren't embedded in things, so if you add any images and stuff, you're going to have to zip it up. I think into a zip file with the notebook and the any other assets that aren't embedded in the file. That's one annoying thing of Jupyter notebooks that I don't quite like, but uh, it makes it difficult to share th share some of the files because they're not all in one. Um, so you got to create that notebook, and then I'll uh, um, we'll just it'll be random order presentations, five minutes strict on those lightning talks. So keep it brief and um, uh, get to the point, right? You don't want to get bogged down in the details of uh, math equations probably or any of the fine details, but you want people to come away with your sort of elevator pitch of the uh, project. You know, what, uh, what you wanted to figure out, how you modeled it and approached it, and what your results are are probably the, the main, main things there. 
So it'll be five minutes. Um, I'll time you and uh, and cut you off if you go over. So make sure to practice. Don't go over. And then we can um, either leave at the end of all of them. So we got what eleven people, I think. So it'll it'll you know in an hour and. 10, 20 minutes will be done. And if people want to chat about their projects with each other, you, you certainly can, or we can all, all go home. OK? And uh, I will take into account your um, presentation to into your grade also. It won't be a ma major portion of it, but uh, it'll be a factor. The report will be the main, main aspect. Questions on, on those project presentations? And there's, a, if you need an adapter, I have the one for the um, uh, mini display port that I think works on Macs and whatever one has mini display ports. If you need an adapter to S uh, VGA, you should bring that to show. You. No, it's just a VGA. Just a VGA. So if, um, you guys can, does anybody, uh, what, what, do, what do people need? HDMI? Um, the large HDMI or the mini? Does anybody have an HDMI, VGA to HDMI? I don't think well, can you go from mini display port to HDMI? I'll try to find one too, but you should, somebody, you all should all also ask around. Maybe your lab mate or something has one. Okay. So that would be the only one that's needed then at large, um, the, the normal size HDMI. All right, I'll, see, I'll ask Jacob too. Um, all the questions? Okay, so let's go back to this trajectory optimization. We uh, rapidly uh, finished those up uh, there, and the, and the solution didn't quite come out. I didn't make the one plot that I wanted to show. So to remind you, um, what do we do? <clears throat> I'll start here. We created an objective that minimized the sum of the squares of the torque applied to this single pendulum. And that um, is effectively minimizing the energy needed. It, uh, it's, um, and the sum that I use there is, is, is uh, the discretized and sending them to the integral that I had in the equations I showed you. Then we made these constraints that basically says at time equals zero, make theta equal zero. At, at time equals the end of the simulation, make theta equal the target angle. And then omega, the, the angular rate, should be zero at the beginning and the end of the simulation. Right, so these are these specific constraints. And then we use this opti problem to provide it the objective, the gradient of the objective. Um, and, and, and note that these are um, the optimization method that's running underneath is called an interior point optimizer. And you may come across it. Um, there's a nice open source implementation called IPopt. And that's what's running in the background here. And it is a. Um, it does require the gradient of the objective and the Jacobian of the constraint equations. So it requires the derivatives. It is not a derivative-free optimization method. And, uh, and in fact, it also um, it helps to calculate the Hessian, too, which is the second derivative of each of those. You give it the symbolic equations of motion. You tell it what your states are, in our case, theta and omega, how many discretized points we want to go over, what's the time interval between each discreti discretization. All right. And then here, I provide some known parameters. And those were the uh, known mass and length, or gravity and length of the pendulum, I believe, would have been there. Or maybe there was inertia, too. So these were just setting what those uh, system constants were, give it the constraints. And then I also said, well, we have a limited torque. Use minimal energy for your torque, but 
you can't ever go over 1.75 Newton meters or below negative 1.75 Newton meters. And then um, yeah, these were uh, showing that it calculates the, uh, these are all the constraints, and this is the Jacobian of the constraints, and how fast those went. And then we, uh, we gave it an initial guess, and in this case, I, I just gave it some, a vector of random numbers. So the, the number of free, remember that this optimization is, is a bit unique because we don't have a small number of values um, that we're trying to find. 3,000 unknown variables in our case. Um, and those are the trajectories of the states at each of the discretized times and the trajectory of that input torque. Okay, so um, there's a thousand discretizations in each one. And then we call problem solve. It solves it. And this is the plot that didn't show up last time. Okay, so here we now see theta, omega, and torque. Okay, and I had a little bug in the software, so this plot will still not show up for you. I'll, I'll, I'll update that on the server soon in case you want to use it. But um, notice that um, theta um, goes from 0 to, did I plot these in, uh, this is in radians, so 1 point, uh, 1 1.89 and um, Right, that's, what do we want? We wanted the init target angle to be pi. So pi is 3.14, so why is it not there? It's maxing out the torque in a bang bang. Is it not quite able to do that? With those torque bounds. Let, let's back off on the torque. I can't remember uh, why we had those torque values. Um, let's say 2.75. And I'll solve it again. Forget exactly what, what we were doing there. It's possible that it's, it's not possible to solve it. So if I didn't, if I just didn't have enough torque, then um, and in fact, maybe maybe it'd be nicer just to solve it without the bounds first. All right. So here's a. There we go. So I, I backed off on the torque, and um, and it's less sort of bang bang there. It found this torque trajectory that ensures that we go from zero to pi, okay, and that omega is zero at the beginning and zero at the end. So it found it found that trajectory very quickly. Um, if we take away the bounds, <clears throat> we'll see the sort of truly um, So, I forgot am I showing. Um, th this output too, I realize doesn't show up on the server. Um, I'll, we'll look at it in a second. Okay, so here, here's a solution that uh, doesn't have bounds on the torque, so it, we can we can give it as much torque as we want, and we can we see that we go just up to almost two and three quarter, and then we get the same result that we were requiring. Okay, so this um, is the, the minimal energy or the minimal um, minimizing the sum of the squares of the torques uh, to get that behavior. All right, so we've got an optimal trajectory here, um, and it solved relatively fast. Um, this plot, it automatically plots the constraint violations for you. 
So remember that we had um, the equations of motion are our, are our constraints. We want those to hold at each time point. So at each node, <clears throat> it says, does Newton's law hold? And this tells us, um, does the uh, first and the second equation that we passed in hold, essentially? And notice these are pretty low in terms of machine precision. Um, so these are effectively zero that we get uh, um, that Newton's law is, is holding there. Okay? Um, it's not perfect, though. And then these list the instance constraints. And this plot is not that useful because this basically is saying, well, did we meet our constraints of the angle being at zero um, and pi? And did we meet our constraint of omega being at zero? And uh, I think these are just plotting dots at zero. They're, they're zero, too. And I need to make a better, a better way to maybe visualize that, maybe like a bar, probably a bar chart or something would look better. So our constraints were, were valid. Um, this plot is a, is a default plot it gives you two. It shows you how many iterations the um, IP opt, the interior point optimiza optimizer, took. It took just under 30. And each of these is one of the iterations. And we can see that this is plotting the objective value. This is the sum of the torques that we were trying to minimize. And it tried something, tried something, tried something, tried something. And then it, it, it found this minimal. Uh, and it, it's a local optimal. And um, if we ran this a bunch of times with a lot of random guesses, and we always ended up there, we would feel comfortable that we're at at a reasonably comfortable that we're at the global optimum. So it's not, um, it's not, you're not guaranteed to get to the global optimum. And, but the fact that it computes so fast, you, you can then use um, various um, methods to try to get there. And a lot of um, other methods, like to get the walking model that I showed you all working, um, we give it an initial guess of it just standing, initial guess of it like uh, falling forward a little bit. And then if you give it these sort of somewhat close to real motion guesses, um, then it can often find the global uh, optimum. But if you give it random values or all zeros, um, you, may, you may get hung in local, local optimums. Questions, Chris? So, Yeah, you guys seen that? How many people have seen the DeepMind uh, running video that came out like two months ago? Let's let's just show that. That's worth seeing. Okay, so what DeepMind uses is not it's not this me method. So in in there's a lot of ways. They're all ultimately optimization problems, right? The whole, like, when people say machine learning, uh, it boils down to solving, finding an optimal something given a model. Now, what these guys are using, a deep mind is a really deep neural network. And it turns out that, um, is, how many people know what a neural network is? A few? So, so yeah, so a neural network um, was originally trying to think about modeling how the mind accepts information and uh, does something with it and, and makes things happen. And um, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a super complex, com uh, a complex uh, thing, but basically if you take a lot of these little um, nonlinear functions called sigmoid functions and <clears throat> you layer them together such that... Um, so here's one thing. Our, our, we've, we found these sort of deterministic equations of motion that, just, that govern. If I push on something, it's going to move in this way. A neural network um, would assume that we don't know anything about physics. We don't care about Newton's laws, right? But in place of that, I'm going to create this set of layers of these sigmoid functions that I can tie together in a complex network and it turns out that if you layer enough sigmoid functions and have them all connected together, uh, that the first layer, you pass in, in our case, the torques that would make the joints move. The first layer, like, will compute all these sigmoid functions, 
and then it passes the results of all of those to the next layer, right? And then at the end, you want eventually it to output the angles that people are moving, right? The actual motion. Well, <clears throat> if you do um, just a few layers, uh, you can imagine finding those parameters associated with each of those sigmoid functions, essentially. And so you're sort of doing a parameter search that says, you know, what, what parameters for each of these little functions, and I think there's only one. Do you know, John, is there only one in those um, per sigmoid? Basically, you, there's, and there's some specific methods to try to find these parameters, too. So it's not like just a straight-up optimization. It's a, it's a, um, um, a very uh, specific way that you walk through this optimization problem. But you're trying to find all these parameters for these little functions that are tied together in this network. And if you can find them all, right, you can, and you can still have the same kind of objective, like I want to run from point A to B using minimal energy, um, and I have a network that's deep enough, and I find all those parameters, um, you, may, you may get this optimal motion again. So the key thing, though, it's a big black box. It has nothing, it doesn't know anything about Newton's laws. And, um, and you can, um, and you solve this optimization problem to try to find those parameters of all the layers. Well, DeepMind has layers that are like, I don't know, millions deep. I mean, just, there's so many parameters in there, way more than I'm trying to find with, with these, these problems, too. And um, <clears throat> it takes an insane amount of computation power to train these um, neural networks. And the results, of the, these are probably like, you know, Google's biggest clusters running for weeks and weeks, or a year for that matter, trying to solve this problem. And it's a phenomenal solution. And um, we'll play, play the video. I think this is the, the right one. Maybe, maybe this one. It's not very good quality, huh? So this says, given some rigid bodies um, um, that can move, and uh, actually, I think it, it may have Newton's laws built into it. I think it does. This does have like collision and such built into it. And it says, try to get from A to B as fast as you can, or something like that, as an optimization. And um, and then it has a neural network that models the control system that. Um, and it might, I think, it's probably just open loop controls like we're doing right now. I actually haven't read the paper in detail to tell you the perfect truth. But, uh, and then they, they run these uh, things, and they, um, and in fact, it's not, um, I don't think it's trained on any, any data. It's just a, sort of a reinforcement learning type of um, method. And it ends up discovering how to move and, and move within a physics within some, some laws of physics that have to happen, right? We can't penetrate through objects. Um, I can only move my um, le the legs relative to the sphere, things like that. So this spider here learns to walk. And I don't think this is the latest video either. What was the one where the guy was just running crazy? Um, is that an iterative process? Like it, you kind of yeah, this one. This, this is one of the more recent. Um, it is. It is. Uh, it is an iterative, iterative process. Um, the reinforcement learning process. Is that who has that? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is, is uh, the first one, it basically tries something and it collapses and falls, but it it records that information, and it says and it waits like whether it should continue to try things like that or not, essentially. And, um, and then you, <clears throat> you do this over and over again, and if you try enough things, you can start to build, oh, well, that one out of a million, that one sort of worked, that moved me forward from one meter, you know? So then you, like, start going down that path, and you do a million based off of that, maybe. And then, oh, we find one that moved me two meters. And if you have enough computing power, which Google, you know, has some of the world's most computing power, they're able to find find these solutions. So this is something that, um, you know, we don't even have the resources at the, at the San Diego supercomputing facility maybe to, to run this yet. Um, and the solutions still are goofy, right? It's not quite what humans do, <laughs> right? But, but there's a lot of similarities. 
So this stuff is all, it's all connected, and, um, and these uh, set of tools in the machine learning world and the, and the you know, growth of powerful computers allows us to solve these same kind of problems. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to solve somewhat similar problems, but I've been using these methods I just showed you that take a lot less computation power. <laughs> you don't run like that? All right. Okay, well, good question, and a good thing to talk about there. But it's all tied together. It's all very similar, and um, there's also some, some great... Uh, I'll show you some, some better ones. Uh, let's see. Jack Wang um, website. Jack Wang uh, walking sim. Oh, he... He moved to Toronto recently. Um, once you put muscle dynamics into these, uh, just like my moonwalk, the moonwalker I showed you, uh, you can end up getting um, nicer, more human-like motions. And this um, this used sort of the naive sort of shooting method that I told you is not so great, uh, and it took quite it takes weeks of computing power to get these two on a smaller cluster. Uh, but he has uh, the sort of constituent muscle model, models built into this that sort of enforce some physiology that we know from first principles. And he's able to find um, more realistic uh, walking than what we saw in the Google DeepMind. But for a very simple task like just walking up an incline or walking on a flat, not jumping and things. But this probably, I'm sure this could be extrapolated to more complex maneuvers. Um, oh yeah, here's, here's his iterations. And keep in mind, his iterations probably take, each iteration takes um, uh, at least a minute to run, I think, on his cluster. So that'd be a thousand minutes, right? Three thousand minutes, <clears throat> essentially. Um, and he has to... Uh, in every iteration, he's actually using a um, genetic algorithm. He's running a collection of iterations, too, on a cluster. But, uh, so these are really nice results. <clears throat> uh, another stu uh, guy uh, did um, these right after him at Delft, at, uh, out of TU Delft. Uh, let's see. Walking creatures. Um, uh, I forget his name. Uh, Thomas um, simulation. Yeah, the, these here. Um, he used the same muscle-based things, but um, did uh, different different creatures. So there's a human, but he also did like dinosaurs and things. So this was the same thing that Jack Wang did, but. Um, Using this muscle, all these little elements are, are muscle actuators, uh, but he changed sort of the geometry to fit different other kind of interesting creatures to see, well, how would, how would they walk? And um, it uses this covariance matrix adaptation. It's a really nice genetic algorithm that's been um, having a lot of success lately. Uh, so you can see it's also sort of... <clears throat> learning from its mistakes in these two, in these iterations, and that's how the optimization works. But So th that's a nice set of work, and um, <clears throat> there, a lot of these papers, too, come out of the um, graphics community. So if you keep an eye on the SIGGRAPH uh, conference, that's where all the hot stuff comes out of that. Um, another fun tidbit of Notion, Another fun tidbit. One of the first demonstrations of this. So if you've seen this logo, <clears throat> that lamp there, This in the 80s when they first developed that, um, I think it was the late 80s, they, uh, that lamp jumps around pretty realistically, right? Well... <clears throat> That wasn't just an animator thinking about how the lamp should move and drawing each frame. 
uh, it actually was solved with the direct collocation method that I'm showing you. So the Pixar lamp jump is also uh, from, from those methods. I think there's one more that I wanted to show you. That was a recent uh, work. There, there's a, a woman out of um, Georgia Tech in their uh, graphics, computer science department in the graphics lab, and she's got some, oh, some amazing work, too. Um, actually, her, it's her student that is, is, is a rock star that's done a lot of cool things, but uh, let's see if I can get that video. That is um, bicycle... Um, Simulation, uh, blah, 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 blah. bicycle simulation, uh, Georgia Tech. Simulation um, graphics. Lou, Karen Lou, she's got some really nice work, if you like this stuff. Um, but her student, I don't know if she has it listed here. Okay, th this one is quite nice. So this, you have a physics, oh, come on. Let's see if we can get a video of this. I think uh, oh, that's, that's the paper. Maybe this will do it. Um, yeah. Okay, so this one, you take a physics model that has a bicycle and a person, and they used um, a particular type of neural network on this one, too, and uh, were able to find sort of optimal balancing and things. This is just riding over bumpy stuff, but it gets cooler. Um, riding down steps, right? And so they're they're optimizing to find the uh, open loop controls to make this happen, and then um, hop a curb, right? That's a that's a solution that's discovered from this optimization. You know, nothing's pre-programmed there. It's like if you want to get over a curb, well, well, what motion should you do? Well, uh, we know what we would probably do on our bike, and uh, this optimization algorithm discovered that. And then he's even got, uh, oh yeah, wheelies. Right, so these are all optimal solutions, saying go from point A to B with, only, with your front wheel off the ground and, uh, and see what happens, right? And these, this one probably had a specification a stop with the back wheel off the ground and um, or some kind of or balance on the front wheel. So you, you put these sort of goals in mind and, um, and then these are optimal solutions. And that's exactly what a BMX rider would do if, if they were doing that. So these are really cool things and, and it's all, um, it's all tied to what I've been showing you here. All right, so that, that was an aside, probably hopefully worth it. Those are a lot of these are these are a lot of the cutting edge solutions um, that, we're, that you're seeing popping out. So if you want to, if you like this stuff, <clears throat> and um, you want to look into some of those, and those are some of the ones that I've seen in the past few years that have really um, stood out as uh, cool solutions. They're mostly in the human biomechanics world because that's what I've been spending my time in. But there's, there's there's other things too. There's some. Neat solutions too of people, people and creatures swimming in water. So when you add fluid around it too, and, um, and things. So this is a, this is a very simple, you know, way to get a solution like this. And then you know, and then you can play that animation and see and see how it works. But um, that's the gist of this. Any questions on like like what the heck I did there? I know it's a it's a lot for we've only talked about it just over half of a half a class, um, but the idea is that you <clears throat> the key thing is you discretize the states, you discretize the state equations. I'm sorry, let me get all this right. Discretize the equations of motion, 
and treat these as constraints, and then you can form what is called a nonlinear programming problem. And a nonlinear programming problem has a specific form that um, has an objective function and, and some constraint and, in a, and potentially a large number of constraints that you want to hold. And, uh, and then there are various algorithms that can solve these optimization problems that have large number of unknowns and large number of constraints in that realm. Uh, the one that we're using behind the scenes here is called IPOPT, interior point optimization. But there's also sequential quad quadratic programming um, is another uh, method of optimization, and uh, you can find that in, um, in fact, I think that F. Mincon and MATLAB is using sequential quadrat quadratic programming, and, um, but it doesn't handle large number of variables well. There's a program called SNOPT, S-N-O-P-T, that um, is uh, a sequential quadratic programming for large-scale problems that uh, people find a lot of success with. So I, um, I don't have the plug-in working for SNOPT for this yet. SNOPT is, is proprietary. You have to buy it from, I forget who it is, Stanford or something. Um, and, uh, and, but IPOPT is a, a guy open sourced his dissertation where he developed that one, and it's quite, quite a powerful thing. All right, I was going to show you, too, this, I need to figure out how to get it to display in the notebook, but this is sort of what, this is what uh, run, when you say problem solve, this is what you see. It, in, it formulates the whole problem, takes your symbolics, turns it into this nonlinear program pro problem behind the scenes, and then passes that to IPOPT, which is this interior point optimizer. And <clears throat> it says, oh, um, number of non-zeros in the equality constraints in the Jacobian, so I had 9,994 constraint equations to hold in the Jacobian of the equations of motion, that set of constraints. And um, total number of variables, right? We're searching for 3,000 different variables. That's 1,000 for each of the three trajectories. And um, they all have a lower and upper bounds, which are um, um, infinity, I think, in our case, in that last one that we round. But if we you could put bounds on all those and say, well, I, uh, the trajectories can only stay in with, within some uh, regime. And the equality constraints, da da da. And then here's, and then, it, and then this runs live while the iter optimization is happening, and you see that um, it gives this output. In the output is useful. I don't. Rem this is the objective value that you're trying to decrease, right? That's the sum of the uh, torques in our case. And then, I forget all the details right now, but you look in the manual and you can interpret a lot of what these are. And you'll have, and sometimes, and these are often important. Um, another issue with this method is that uh, you have to scale the problems. Um, and some of these help you work on that. But anyways, this is the output from the optimizer. And then it only took 37, 37 iterations to get that solution, whereas, um, if we did it like the guy did uh, that I showed you with the human walking, it could have taken us hours and hours to get, get that solution, in fact. So this is, I think this is pretty nice because of that. It tells us what our final objective is, the error, and then um, how many times we evaluated each of these functions, the gradient, the constraints, the Jacobian, and then um, this too, like... Uh, it spent 1.6 seconds in IP opt functions. And, and then these are our functions that Opti creates. So these came from evaluating the equations of motion at every time step, at every iteration. And that was only half a second, right, for all, all of those, which is nice. So this solved in just over two seconds for that, for that which, is, which is pretty nice. All right. Questions there and things? Here's another. I showed this uh, demo. Same problem, essentially, except a double pendulum. And in this case, um, let's just show another video to, get it, to frame this. Um, So 
so the, the pendulum and the double pendulum are a very nice, um, you know, classic sort of standard problems to work with. Uh, but this is essentially the problem <clears throat> that I've shown. And this is a real robot, right? There's a double pendulum on a track. <clears throat> you control only the track. And um, how do I swing it up and balance it? All right, so that got into that particular equilibrium point and, uh, and then swings up to that equilibrium point and then up to this final equilibrium point. All right, so the question is, well, what, what do I push on that robot to make it do that? And what I just showed you can find you that solution. Okay? Um, it's, it's trickier when you have a real robot um, the dynamics aren't these. I, this isn't an ideal thing. It's a real system. It has friction. It has um, speed limitations. It has, uh, iner you know, real inertias. Um, it has electrical motor, you know, realities that you have to deal with. And um, but you can solve solve that same kind of thing. So this is the problem that I'm that I solve with the software I just showed you. Um, you can theoretically do it with as many links as you want, but the question I'm asking here then is, what's F to get the pendulum down to up with minimal energy? Same, same kind of thing. And F is the force that I push on that cart. So I'll load this up. And this one takes a little longer to solve. It usually takes about, uh, it takes maybe three to five minutes to get the solution often, and it's more likely, it lands in a local optima more often too. So you gotta, you gotta run that with random initial guesses, uh, that five minute thing, you know, maybe over uh, half an hour to an hour to, make, to get confident that you're at the global optimum. Okay, so this one takes longer than that single pendulum. So I, I'm gonna load a, these are what the equations of motion look like. Um, it just uses opti, right, we've got a, and it's nonlinear. Equation of motion expression. Um, I set some constraints, some constant values here, right? There's two pendulum lengths, two masses, three masses, sorry, the mass of the cart and the mass of the two pendulum bobs, and then gravity. Um, I say let's do 10 seconds, 500 nodes. And then my objective is to minimize the, some, of the, some of the forces um, at each time instance. So very similar. Set up that same objective. I set my task constraints um, or my instance constraints. I didn't pick, haven't picked a word on that. Basically, it tells me that I want um, I want to start. Uh, this one turns out to be that uh, a zero, I think, is defined out here. So I want to start at negative pi and then get up to pi. All right. So I tell that these are the angles, Q1 and Q2, and then I want it to be at zero at the beginning uh, velocity and zero velocity at the end. Once again, construct the problem. So that takes the symbolics and it formulates this big problem here um, in, an, in a very numerically efficient way. We've got 3,500 things to find this time. Um, now, I'm going to just first just load in this is the solution I found when I did, you know, solve the problem the first time. So we can check it out. Um, we can plot, plot the results here. All right. So this is the solution that I think was the global that I ended up getting. The first one's the force. Starts at zero and it pushes on the cart and eventually no force. Um, this cart slides 15 meters, though, uh, across while this is happening. The cart doesn't have any friction in it or nothing to pull it back. Here are the angles. We go from the starting angle and we get to some end angle, and that is, in fact, um, well, I don't have the notebook thing, but that gets to the right angle, right? That gets them both up. And then we see that the angular um, rate for all of them go to zero, um, and the speed of the cart goes to zero, too. 
You can plot the constraint violations in the same way, and we see that Newton's law holds basically to e, 1 e to the negative 13 for all of these constraints, and, and for those instant constraints, I don't know why the other plot didn't come out like this, but this sort of shows, I guess they were all actually zero. There's, um, these are 1 e to the negative 19. And then um, this is a little nicer visualization using the uh, sim SymPy. So if I, uh, I'll put this on loop. If I play that, and right, let me zoom out. So this is um, the op that optimal is so tiny. Huh? So it finds this force that um, swings that pendulum up from one state to another and, and stops. Okay? And uh, that, that's, you know, a two degree, a three degree of freedom system in this case that we found the trajectories, the optimal trajectory for in the same method. And. Um, <clears throat> This one is, well, it, it takes a little long to run run some other ones because uh, I don't, I'm not going to do that in class. All right, but that's that's a more uh, more detailed example. Um, I can show to the this is a parameter identification one. Um, where I model a human standing on a platform, <clears throat> and we shake the human at the platform, and the idea is, well, how do you, what do you do to balance and stand up? Like, what is the control mechanism? Um, so here, instead of having open loop trajectories for those torques, I make a little simple um, uh, proportional derivative um, multi-state feedback controller. And, the, and that controller has different parameters inside of it, different gains. I think all this is running. Um, right there, it has eight gain values for the proportional and the derivative control gains in this thing. And I say, um, the question here now is then, well, what are those control, what are those gain values um, that a person would have used if I had some measured data of a person actually balancing on this thing, if I could only measure his, his, that, that person's motion. So I provide the measured motion, I assume a control model, and then I'm looking for these parameters. Get the equations of motion, um, I, I create some data here, so that's the acceleration of the, of the floor that I apply, um, just up over, just a little, some of them are over one, one G. Um, oh no, sorry, one meter per second squared, and then um, I basically simulate the system and, and make it noisy. So I, si I, I make some fake data that, like, like you would measure from a human. So I get noisy angles only of uh, I model it just with a hip joint, the no no knee uh, motion, hip joint and ankle joint, and um, I get the noisy data. And then I say, okay, given the noisy data and the equations of motion and this control system, what control parameters, what controller would this person use to stand like that? And you set up the problem. The objective then becomes this. I want to minimize the sum of the squares between the measured xm and the simulation. And if I can minimize that, that means my simulation is behaving like what, whatever this measured data is. I set up that objective and then uh, put some bounds on, on how big of gains it can find. Um, solve the problem again, basically the same stuff we just saw. 
And then here are the results. It found some gain values such that the simulation moved like the measured data. So this is um, this is the blue line or the, uh, the model, the simulation's trajectories with the optimal control gains and, how, and shows how close they match to um, these black dots which are the measured data, which will be noisy, real, real life data. So if I measure a person balancing while I shake them and, and, I, and my data is this noisy, um, it does a good job at finding some control parameters that make uh, our simulation behave like what the human actually did in this case. And, and it found, like, oh yeah, these are the values, right? It found, <clears throat> in this case, I know the controller a priori, and those are the gain values. And then line 30 are the ones that the opt optimizer found, which are pretty darn close, okay, from the noisy data. Does that make sense? So this, you can use this, this, these methods to do, to find the, trajectories of the inputs of your model, right? Optimal trajectories. Or you can find optimal parameters. These parameters could be, in my case, control gains in this closed loop system. Or they could be, you know, what's the optimal um, mass of a uh, baseball bat for hitting baseballs or something. You know, and, that, and that mass is a parameter, a constant in, in the equations of motion, so you could find an optimal value of it. Questions on this, this aspect? Not, not that any, I don't think anybody here is necessarily doing that. Maybe you, you've got real data. Um, but uh, equally, you can do, system, um, these are called parameter identification or system identification type of problems. And, it, and, the, and the, what makes them special is that the objective is trying to minimize your simulation output um, motion, uh, the, di the difference in the simulation output with respect to some measured thing from a real, from a real system. And, um, and that you're finding, looking for these parameters which are typically constants in the um, equations of motion. Whereas the trajectory optimization, um, there's no specifics about what the uh, objective has to be, but you're trying to find um, the values of um, things that change over time for every single time value. Okay. So what do you think? Interesting stuff? Make any sense? Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, I'm not expecting you to learn it, and I'm not going to test you on this or anything, uh, but <clears throat> it's, it's a preview to, like, the power of these, th these tools. And um, so if, you, if we know some things about physics, right, Newton's laws, and, and from, first, from a pr first principles perspective, which is what you've learned in this class, um, and then you combine it with a variety of optimization tools, we can start answering questions about... Um, you know, what, what are optimal designs of machines? You know, what are <clears throat> optimal training for an um, athlete, right? What are um, optimal um, fuel consumption for shooting a rocket to Mars? All these kind of questions, you know, get to get answered with these. And um, there's lots of people working on that, lots of cool solutions, and, and it you know, permeates all, all domains. Um, and then where this class fits in is that if it happens to be a system that follows Newton's laws to some degree, then, then you, can, you can utilize these aspects, okay? So if you're interested in this stuff and, and you know, want to know more, just come talk to me. And, um, I, I like this stuff, and this is what I spend my re a lot of my research time thinking about and working on. Um, Scott actually worked with me this summer, and we presented a, a paper um, in September, um, trying to, that's part of a project to find what are the optimal designs of bicycles such that they're easy, they handle easily. easily. I didn't say that quite well. Um, so you can think about controlling any vehicle from a 
airplane to a car to a bicycle to a surfboard to a skateboard anything really and and the person has to do some control maneuver to make it do you know these d different um, tasks and um, you can th I mean it's not the case anymore it's like every car you buy these days um, they all pretty much handle well but when I was younger like we had these big boat 1980 cars and you guys probably, you know may remember those too but uh um, like a big Ford Lincoln or something, and, and they just handled awful, right? And so if you compare it to a Porsche or something, um, you know, we can detect how awful one given system is that we're trying to make do, make it do what we want to do. And, um, and there must be an optimal, right? There must be an optimal vehicle design for um, traversing the racetrack at... Uh, up near Willits or whatever, or any, any given thing, or there's an optimal design for um, swerving to not hit a person, okay, that will translate directly from a person to what the vehicle does. So, the, so that's one of the research problems I've, I've been working on, and I picked a bicycle because it's cheap and, um, and it's a fun dynamical system to try those kind of things on. And, uh, and also I just like bikes, but... Uh, so the optimal thing I've been I've been working is this uh, optimal handling and like how can you change the design of a vehicle such that it optimi it it has optimal handling or how can you change the control system in a vehicle where you have a human in the loop with that control system such that it provides optimal handling. So any of these things where you want to ask what is optimal about a dynamic system, you you you, you get to go down this direction. Questions? What what made sense? Or what was the most cloudy cloudy thing about all that? Josh, I'll go ahead and finish. Um, you had mentioned earlier something about the sigmoid functions. Yeah. Uh, how do those relate to learning? Is that just a... Yeah. Well, it, it just turns out that if you stack enough of them together and, and layer them, so if I have a sigmoid function and I send an input out, it makes an output, right? If I then layer a bunch of sigmoid functions and they all have sl uh, a different value, so they, given an input, they sl give a slightly different output, um, then you can imagine I send in a signal into one, and it changes, and it goes into the next one, and it spits out something else. So if I had enough of them in a row, um, maybe I can, maybe it represents like a, a polynomial, or maybe it represents some kind of, some kind of function, really. Is this mathematically speaking, is this pretty, making the functions nested inside one each other? Mathematically speaking, is that um, given enough sigmoid functions, you can construct any mathematical function. All right, and then secondly, that was just a linear layer of them. Uh, the other thing is, is um, we have multivariate systems, right? Lots of variables. So uh, then you imagine a, a layer of sigmoids that all take input from um, all the variables you might me measure or something that that would make this system behave in some way. And then the results of all those then go to each and every one of the next layer of sigmoids. And, uh, and so then you have this, um, now a network of connected sigmoid, sigmoid functions. And at each layer, it outputs something depending on what are all the values of these, um, um, all the sort of uh, constants associated with these sigmoid functions. And so if you make the layer deep enough, then you can uh, model a, any given multivariate function, right, it, it's a, is the idea there. And so, um, but it takes a lot of layers for complex things, especially, you know, what's really going on in a human mind in terms of running and stuff like that. Does that help? Yes. I didn't know you could approximate any other function with sequence. Yeah, that's sort of the, the, ma the thing. And you can probably do it with a lot of functions. Um, but it, it relates to things like, um, you know, I can um, uh, make a... Fourier series, so any periodic function that exists, 
no matter if it's um, nonlinear, um, dis, uh, um, discontinuous, or continuous, I can um, represent that as a sum of sines and cosines. Right, so that's a that's a that's a way a similar idea, and you can, and um, and then um, with a Taylor series, I can represent any function. Not they don't have to be periodic, with an infinite series of um, derivatives and second derivatives and third derivatives of of the function essentially. So the sigmoid functions are just. Um, I, I'm sure that you can do. There's, I'm sure there's a variety of of many simple nonlinear functions that you can combine, combine enough of them together that you can you can uh, uh, re represent a, um, a complex function and it happens to be one that is very useful and um, things and it was actually when it was invented like in the 60s it was just ignored for many years because the computers didn't have the power you couldn't really do anything with it and it really wasn't too um, more recent advent of gobs and gobs of computational power that these became useful because you got to find you got to like have so many layers to do anything complex and um, and each of the layers have have all these, these this unknown parameter or parameters. Chris, you have a question. You wrote down. Yeah. So you stack up all these signal functions. Uh, it sounds like. Well, <clears throat> uh, you don't typically. Do, I mean, the, ba the ba I'm not. I'm not. You know, this. I don't know. Uh, I'll hit some limits of my knowledge, knowledge at some of these answers. But the gist is, um, if we think of uh, a dynamic system, maybe we say it's a spaceship, and this is a real thing. And if I, um, um, if I. Uh, explode some fuel in in its turbines ultimately this spaceship is going to have a velocity right so there's a there's a relationship between um, how much fuel and how often I've you know ignited in this turbine to its velocity um, but for us to write, it would be—it's not trivial to write the first principle relations. We could, in fact, we could make a model of the turbine engine. Um, we could make a model that we've done in class of the spaceship, the Newton's laws. We could have um, all the electrical systems uh, that are tied into that, the control system, right there too, et cetera, all are all in this box. And um, and maybe you could even maybe instead of fuel, we'd say. Um, Maybe the throttle button, right? The throttle button on the spaceship. So, you know, the last 100, 200 years of engineering is making first principle models of things like this. We think about a small little chunk. Well, I know how friction rubs, so I can think about how that would work if in a, uh, in, in a, in a turbine that might be have some friction. Or I think about a Newton's fundamental law about a particle and a, and a rigid body, and I can expand it to everything that's moving in this thing. So you've got a big black box of what this real system is, but, it, but there is a relationship. If I press the throttle, some velocity happens. And um, the idea is that you take this thing and... Um, actually, the, fir the first layer, if the throttle is the only thing that goes in, And here's a little sigmoid that has a parameter associated with it, parameter one. And then I set up a network, and I can make this as much as I want. A bunch of other sigmoids, they all have parameters associated with them. And then I make another sigmoid. And then here, I can make each one of those go to every one. Right, I can make this crazy network of all the outputs of these sigmoid functions go to every go go proportionally in some way to each next layer. 
of sigmoids. And then um, maybe they all, they all end up in one final one, and then we get uh, velocity. Or maybe it's the final three, three components of velocity or something like that come out of this. V1, V2, V3. And, and this, this, again, is this complex network, right? <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> it turns out that if you, if, you make a, if you make enough of these layers and enough connections that um, this set of sigmoid functions can potentially model the relationship of that, what is happening in real life with this spaceship. And I don't have to know anything about first principles. I don't have to know anything. But I've got to figure out what all these parameters are. And there's this uh, method of uh, forward and backward propagation through this network that um, uh, given a set of data, it will, uh, you can, try, you can um, propagate through the network and try to find what those parameters are in an optimal way such that it, me such that, um, it, it meets some criteria. And the, and the way you... The, the standard way is I take the real spaceship, I measure the throttle, and I measure its velocity, right? So I have data of a real spaceship going up into there. And so I have input and output data that I train the neural network on. And this, this propagation method will is a specific method for finding all those parameters for each of these sigmoid functions such that... Um, um, the result of when I put a throttle into this network, the Vs will match the measured Vs that, the, that we took off the real spaceship. And then if you don't have any measured data, well, you can do this reinforcement learning thing where you basically generate a bunch of failure data and, and use that to, 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 um, as, as the data set instead of uh, some, some measured data from a real a spaceship. So you could sort of simulate a spaceship um, or you theoretically could do it with a real spaceship and, uh, if, you want, if you had enough fuel to do millions and millions of iterations. But Does that help at all, Chris? You're staring at a computer now. Just looking it up. Uh, it seems like that's the I think what you're saying, though, is sort of what happens. I mean, um, and, and that's, that is training that's no, no network on the data set. All right. So, uh, yeah, these are, these are popular solutions now. One thing, though, that engineers don't like, and, and I don't necessarily like it, um, is it doesn't give you insight into the physics of, of the system. We don't know uh, fundamentally how the brain's working, if this represents a brain. We don't know how the turbine engine's working, if this represents a turbine, whatever. It's a, it's a black box, and you, you have no, um, I don't think there's currently, there's currently no way to take what this is <clears throat> and um, give you physical insight about what's happening in that, in between the inputs and the outputs. So that's, that's a dis potentially a disadvantage, but uh, uh, the walk, some of the walking things combine uh, Newton's law with these, right? This may, just represents the human controller, and then we still have um, these are control outputs that then go into f equals ma, which have physiology, first principle models, and things, such that we can sort of combine um, both of those. And, and actually, the be some of the best results in the biomechanics world are the combination of those two. Okay, all right. We'll leave it at that. I mean, this is this is like you know. For food for your thought, you guys got a, you got uh, your uh, however many years you're going to spend with us working on your graduate work, and um, and if you uh, if that entices you, maybe it'll be useful for solving some of the problems that you all are doing. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. Come out, come back at twenty after, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the class um, talking about uh, linear models, lin linearizing dynamic models. Okay. The line that connects the two points. 
So, so the idea there is that um, it's y. So the cylinder, each one of the shapes, um, for example, the cylinder. So this is a shape in 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 the parlance of the, uh, and then it has a a y coordinate associated with that shape. And um, it also has a point associated with that shape, which it happens to be at its centroid, its geometric centroid. And um, so, um, so the shape has a coordinate system. And each one of the shapes do, right? Whatever one you pick. And one of the lacking things in our documentation is uh, we've never written down what that where the point is and where these are. You can find them. We, the 3D visualization uses a JavaScript library called 3JS. If you go to their documentation, it'll tell you this, and we haven't translated it over yet. But um, so the, the, the visualization is, um, has some needs in documentation. But uh, cylinder has this. And then <clears throat> if you have two points, and happen to align your b x along that. When you say, and then we create a new point. Well, first you first want to create. Well, you want the cylinder. If I attach the cylinder to this point, well, it's going to align that point with that point. That's one issue. So I want to pick a new point that's halfway between it, and I want to say connect that point to that. Put those points in the same spot. Right, so that you always have to make sure that you create a point on your system such that it's in the right place for that particular shape to land. Well, then that'll put the cylinder. The BX is pointing out the side, so then your cylinder would connect like that. If I connected the B frame to this frame, right? But if I created a new auxiliary frame called C relative to B, but just rotated through st um, 90 degrees, essentially, um, I can then uh, align uh, CY and, uh, and CX. Right? I, can, I can make a new frame that has a rotation relative to B. And then if I connect this frame to C, the cylinder is aligned like I want it. So that's the key thing. So every shape has its own coordinate system and its um, po and a point. And then it's your job to connect that shape to a point in a reference frame that you have defined on your system such that it uh, aligns like you want it. So you'll probably have to create some auxiliary points and auxiliary reference frames in general to get things to align correctly. You don't have to figure out their velocities or anything. You just have to get the coordinates set in the position. So that's a little little detail. Yeah, there's not an easy way to do that. You have, um, yeah, given a shape, or well, what's it, what, how, how is it oriented, how is it defined, and then how is your system defined? We, we've been setting up our systems only with the dynamics in mind, um, the kin kinematics in mind, I guess is a better way to say, not the... Um, the shape of the of the object, and um, other questions on that. Say it again. That's good, yeah. I mean, you, you use whatever you got. And there's, um, yeah. Well, I right, come and come and talk, and we'll get it figured out if you want to use the 3D one. And um, and you know, this this isn't the um, end all tool either. There's uh, a lot of other things that make really fancy simulations too, and um, et cetera, that you if you really want to get into it. But 
All right, <clears throat> let's talk a bit about linearization. So why would you want to linearize equations of motion? Any ideas? Simpler. That's probably the main thing, right? Um, linear models are simpler. Why are they simpler? What, what makes them simpler? Do they have fewer variables? Fewer, fewer um, coordinates, speeds? Nope. I don't, you, don't, you don't lose anything necessarily in that case. Um, where have you, have you used linear models? Control design. Control design. Uh, that's important, right? So um, if you have <clears throat> a set of differential equations that are linear, it becomes, you, it opens up all these tools in control design that um, a, a huge broad wide set of tools to develop controllers for that set of differential equations. So control design, um, sort of the classic and uh, classic um, linear control. All kinds of fun stuff. You can learn about frequency responses. You can um, create Bode plots and Nyquist plots. You can uh, do root locus things. You can, um, you know, long list of things. What else about linear models? What are their weaknesses? Or what, what, where else have you seen some, some linear models? Almost every equation you come across in undergraduate is, is linear. Um, if, you, if you sort of look through undergraduate textbooks in, in all the domain aspects of engineering, um, um, it turns out that well, linear models can represent real phenomena pretty well in, in many cases. And, um, and because they're simpler, um, if you subscribe to the theory that simple models are, are better to use, um, if you don't have to make it complex, don't make it complex. Keep it simple, stupid, the KISS method, right? Uh, then it's a good idea. So the um, um, linear models do a good job. Now, where, do they, where are their weaknesses? Their weaknesses are, um, <clears throat> in terms of dynamics and having a set of differential equations, um, they're only valid at small deviations away from some, op some uh, configuration. Okay, so if we have uh, a pendulum, right, just a simple pendulum, and I swing it back and forth, if I want my pendulum to model flipping all the way around, would a linear model do well for that? It starts to break down. Um, and in, in terms of a pendulum, uh, it's easy to think about that it's only valid for sm small angles of motion, okay? And for, um, if you, when you look at the pendulum equation of motion, you have a sine of theta in there, okay? And a sine of theta, if I increase theta over, I don't know, 30 degrees or so, it starts to deviate quite a lot from um, the actual sine curve that you would, see, that you would plot. So, you know, if I, have uh, theta, and sine of theta, here. If I were to pick any given point and then create a tangent to that, <clears throat> at that point, this is a linear um, 
estimation of sine. So if I if I only care about like from here to here, then maybe that lin that line is is sufficient. But if I linearize at this point and I care about over here, then I'm going to get really bad answers. Okay, and then um, you're often linearizing about theta equals zero, and oops. And if you linearize right here, um, this sort of regime of validity, you know, maybe you can stretch it out to, to up to 30 degrees or something, and it's uh, and your and your line is is an okay representation. Okay, so they have limits. They, they're not going to um, model the world for large angles in this case, away from where you're linearizing about, or um, if you have a very complex nonlinear model with discontinuities or, or anything that um, um, could screw up a linearization, right? So say you have a function that uh, is that, right? How, how can I fit a line to model this? Well, I could, I could fit a line through there like that, but it's, maybe that's an okay model for that, this thing, but maybe it's not. Right. So we want to, it turns out that they are useful in a lot of cases, and, uh, and particularly for small deviations from where um, you're, you're sort of linearizing about this point. Now, um, another aspect is that uh, in dynamic systems, what, what is this point that we might want to investigate small deviations from. Can I recall what that might be? A special point, a special configuration of a, a dynamic system that is uh, particularly interesting and useful. You want to say something, Josh? Other than point of interest? Point of interest? Who's heard of equilibrium points? or equilibrium. So uh, a pendulum, right, its equilibrium is hanging down, and I can imagine um, small motions about that equilibrium point. If I think about the pendulum here, well, all small, small motions are going to make me um, fall down. So, if, so it, it doesn't, it's not at equilibrium here. It's always going to want to move large angles away from that. But at the, here, we can move small angles away from that. Um, so, the a key point that we have to first is um, find is uh, find the equilibrium of the system, and uh, and it turns out that's when all your u's equal zero and all your u dots equal zero. No angular velocities, no linear velocities, no angular or linear accelerations. You end up with what we had in statics 101. A, st a statics problem, right? And um, if you can find an equilibrium, then we can think about um, looking at the um, linear form of the equations of motion about that equilibrium point. All right? So for the pendulum, the equilibrium point, how many equilibrium points does a, a simple pendulum? God. Have? That pendulum we just used in the optimization. What is the equilibrium point of? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go to the chalkboard. I tell you what, why is you know why is that? Uh, What is the equilibrium point of this simple pendulum? A equals zero. Is that the only one? Yep. Theta equals 180 degrees. When it's up vertical, is also an equilibrium point. Okay. So I could, 
an ideal model of a pendulum. I could get it right to the thing, let it go, and it's going to just sit there. Right? <laughs> uh, I don't, well, maybe I'll go to the chalkboard. Let's, we'll see if it stays open. <laughs> debug it. Anybody want to debug it? Delete notebook cache. See if that deletes my notebook for today. Whoa. Whoa, that was not good. No notebooks? Oh, shit. You guys may have just witnessed the loss of all this in the lecture notes. Why would it let me do that? A cache. You would think a cache is... Uh, Shit. All right. Oh, that was on recorded. I just said that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, wow. Makes me just want to quit right now. <laughs> that, that, that worries me. All right. <laughs> oh, maybe we should quit. Oh, because, the, yeah, they're actual files, right? No, there, there's one right there, like, uh, well, okay, something's there. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the equilibrium point here is, uh, in fact, it is an equilibrium point. We could theoretically get it up to the point of stay, but it's an unstable one. If I deviate a little... We we'll get large angle movement, so it's an unstable equilibrium point. The one hanging down, though, is a stable equilibrium point. I can push it away, and it comes back. Okay, so there's stable and unstable equilibrium points. Um, and uh, <clears throat> you want to linearize about a configuration that represents that equilibrium point to find, investigate small deviations from that. And, um, and most, um, most systems have an equilibrium point. We, um, uh, in the case of some of the systems that we've seen, um, the rolling disk has an equilibrium point. At, um, if I just roll it straight ahead upright, it'll roll and it balance itself just like the pendulum stands up, but it is potentially an unstable equilibrium too. Um, we had this, um, our system where we had a spring and a damper connected to a block, and this thing, and, and this thing. I forget the variables we used. Theta and phi, maybe, or Q1 and Q2. What's the equilibrium of that, that system? Talk, talk with your neighbor. Write down what you think all the equilibrium points of that system are. And take, take, take for, uh, a few minutes to do that. The free length of the spring is zero, and uh, also recall that we had a spring here that attached that. So it has two springs. So chat, chat, chat with your neighbor about that. See if you can come up list. Um, and the equilibrium point is going to be s some set of values for x, theta, and phi. Right, so a single equilibrium point has an x, a theta, and a phi. Don't be shy. Talk. Talk about it. Here, you, you two. You two chat. You two chat. You two. You two.
Uh, we got some ideas? Somebody tell me one, uh, an equilibrium point one. How about you, what are you, Gong, in your thing? Zero, zero, zero. How, who doesn't think that's an equilibrium point? All right, so um, the spring is going to want to pull the block back here, right? This is its default position. If I pull the spring away, it slides back. So x equals zero is going to be a, a stable equilibrium point, um, a part of this configuration. Uh, and then if the pendulum is hanging down, right? So this spring pulls, phi, pulls, uh, closes the phi angle, and then if in gravity would pull uh, that down. So if the if theta and phi are both zero. We got equilibrium point number one. What about another one? Is there another one? Zero pi zero. So just like the single pendulum, if I set this vertical and that stays to zero, then I'm just balancing the pendulum, the two pendulums on top of each other. And that's what we did in the double pendulum swing up to try to get it into that uh, particular equilibrium point. And um, what's another one? Yeah, so if gravity is acting on on this thing, um, you could imagine a spring uh, force um, balancing gravity. So, can we do it with this one? If I um, can, I put the. Um, I'm thinking. What do you? What exactly are you thinking there? Yeah, just the third angle. Yeah, so, the third angle. if the other two are zero, can I? Well, I can st stretch the spring around. Go all the way around, and then um, if uh, the force of gravity equaled um, the spring force pulling it up, there's 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 an angle there that potentially holds that. So, the configuration would maybe be something like. Uh, This one's down, and the spring is uh, holding it. Um, this is mg, and so uh, the Now, I think it's. It would also. It would tip this way too, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So theta wouldn't necessarily be zero, but um, there may be this configuration where theta is slightly tipped over. This is like this, such that the um, spring force balances. And there's some angle theta three and uh, some angle V3. So yeah, that seems reasonable. And then there might, um, is there one that you could get it up to if you put up, if you, if theta, if you flip it up, and then they're sort of like this maybe, balancing on each other. I think that one might work too. Um, so if, uh,
So maybe one like that too. We can imagine. So <clears throat> I think that's all that are possible there. Um, <clears throat> each one of those equilibrium points, we could then um, find what are the equations of motion about deviations around that equilibrium point. Right? And if they're stable equilibrium points, we would, we would, we would see some kind of, um, typically see some kind of oscillatory behavior around that um, equilibrium point. And um, if they're not, as soon as you uh, touch it, it would, it would collapse, or it would, in the linear model, would no longer hold. So step one is uh, identifying the equilibrium points of your system. And this was like a men the mental exercise for doing it, and, th and that's good. But you can also um, do it, just do it systematically. So if I have, um, if I have uh, my equations of motion, that are functions of the q's, the u's, and the u dots in time. If, uh, if I set this to 0 and this to 0, then this becomes a um, static force balance. And you have a set of equations and a set of unknowns. <clears throat> and the unknowns are, well, what Q's let the static force balance hold? So if I solve for the Q's of this static equation, um, I should discover all of the equilibrium points of the system. OK, so. Solving that's not always that trivial because you know our equations of motion have often bunches of sines and cosines and a lot of nonlinear terms. Um, so th this is one of the th this um, finding the equilibrium point is uh, not always that trivial um, doing it symbolically, but um, you can find find it numerically is fine. Uh, where else do I want to go? I, I think I'm out of time. I got one more minute. So, what I'm going to, what I'll finish up uh, the beginning of next class then is, um, so that's to get the equilibrium point, and then, well, what's the linearization process? Um, in Kane's book, he has a, he presents a method that I'm not going to go over, uh, which involves formulating all the kin kinematics. And then before you formulate the, equ the equations of motion, you um, assume small, small motions. And then proceed forward, and you end up with linear equations of motion. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of a, a more generic uh, way to do that uh, using a Taylor series. So if you recall, a Taylor series of a single variable, if I have some function f of x, I can represent it as an infinite series that looks something like this. OK, and this is typically. Um, and you keep taking derivatives, and the um, you can also write the sole sum as n equals zero to infinity of uh, f, the nth derivative, evaluated at a over n factorial x minus a raised to the power n. So the Taylor series lets you represent any function with the sum of higher order increasing higher order derivatives of that function. So a, in this case, is a single value. Right? This is the 
linearization point. Think about that sine curve I picked. This would be whatever value of x you want to find a linear line that's tangent to the sine curve. This is the linear term, right? So if I take f prime, plug in a number, a, I get something here, and then I multiply it by x up to the power of 1. So everything in this is going to be linear in x. And x is our um, variable, in our case, um, configurations and speeds it's going to be. And then everything beyond this, I get x squared, x cubed, that those are nonlinear terms. So this portion is the uh, linear portion. And then out here is nonlinear. Right. So that's sort of nice. If I can calculate a derivative, substitute in a value, multiply it by x minus a, I can get a linear approximation of, of any given function. Okay? So I need to end. I'm, I'm going over time. Uh, we'll talk about what the multivariate view of that is next time and how, to, how this applies to um, linearizing your, your models. <laughs>